the crimson sky, a resolute gunshot, and the acrid scent of gunpowder pervaded the scene. The man wielding the pistol against the frightened maiden was darker than the night, more akin to a demon than the demon himself, a true embodiment of death. Gazing upon the trembling maiden, he inquired after her name. She, after encountering this relentless hunter, realized that her life would now become an unending flight. The maiden was a succubus, feasting upon the life force and desires of mortals. To procure some funds for her escape from the hunter, she infiltrated the abode of Ser. However, one particular book within the domicile ensnared her interest when she inadvertently opened and sealed herself within its pages. How on earth did she find herself immersed in a realm of male love? For a succubus, who thrived on the consumption of life energy, the world of male camaraderie, where men shared affectionate kisses, proved to be a true ordeal. She could do nothing there but sit idly by, scavenging for scraps of vitality from the couples. Hence, the maiden had to repeatedly feed on Sarah's energy, an ancient demon. In one of these encounters, the maiden could hardly believe she had once again turned to him. This continued until she encountered the man whose energy she could feast upon. He appeared rather grim, but his physique was nothing to scoff at. The succubus rejoiced, thinking her patience had finally been rewarded. With this bespectacled man, she envisioned engaging in amorous exploits wherever possible. She planned and hoped for it. Yet, why did this man turn out to be the very hunter? Disguised as a young man, the maiden approached the man in the morning, expressing her strong attraction to him. However, her hopes were dashed when he revealed that he had spent the night with her roommate. The succubus, initially disbelieving and slightly confused about whom he referred to, sought clarification. The man then specified that he was referring to her room neighbor, the very attractive designer. The maiden immediately grasped the situation and stormed into the room, where she precisely caught the aforementioned man, the attractive designer, in the midst of an intimate encounter with another woman. She berated him for his actions, questioning how he could indulge in such pleasures while someone else remained without sustenance. Her outburst startled her friend's partner, but she paid it little heed and continued to berate her roommate, emphasizing the importance of professional ethics. Was the demon so starved that he had to resort to the leftovers of others? The man simply looked at the maiden with indifference, lighting a cigarette and inquiring about whom she had tasted. The maiden, however, grew increasingly infuriated. She couldn't comprehend how the man could be so callous toward her source of sustenance. Nevertheless, Ser, this time, gazed coolly at her, asking about whom she was referring to. The maiden somewhat tempered her fervor, explaining that she meant the young man with the architectural background, tall with an appealing physique. Ser then retorted, asking if he was supposed to deduce everything from her description. He suggested it would be better if she wrote her name on the foreheads of her partners. The succubus then remarked that it would be preferable for Ser not to interfere with her choice of partners. Would he respond if she perished from hunger? Did he have any concept of professional ethics? After all, Ser calmly replied that demons had no such concept. The maiden derisively labeled him a filthy demon, but he retorted with mockery, stating that she was just like him. Yes, the maiden was a succubus, feeding on the life force and desires of humans. To gather some funds for her escape from the hunter, she infiltrated Sarah's residence. Yet, that was not the primary predicament. The true conundrum lay in the fact that the book she had been drawn into belonged to the realm of male love. Why, out of all the volumes available, had she been ensnared by this one? In this world, women favored men, and men favored other men. Appalling conditions for nourishing on life energy. No matter how much the succubus feigned to be a man and attempted to entice someone, they instinctively sensed her true gender. People in this world were utterly indifferent to her presence. In the world beyond the confines of this tome, men formed an orderly queue. She believed that within the book, her fortune would be sealed. However, despite half a year having passed there, it marked her fifth failure. It was then that Sarah suggested that the maiden might simply nourish herself with his energy. Yet, despite everything, she believed she still possessed the pride of a demon. She couldn't continuously grovel before Sarah. She needed to find a new source of sustenance. As the maiden exited the room, she admonished Sarah not to tamper with her food any longer. With a mocking tone, Sarah remarked that she should remember her words when she had to beseech him for energy to feed. Upon her departure, Sarah noticed that the night sky was particularly studded with stars. Stars, they say, are the eyes of paradise, and one ought not to stroll beneath them. It's an ancient demonic superstition. However, in the world of this novel, such beliefs held no sway. The maiden entered a bar. Bars were the prime locations for gathering life energy. The fact that they attracted a multitude of passionate men, unreserved in their desires, was the only redeeming aspect of the world within this book. Each of these characters penned their own narrative and engaged in scenes, regardless of whether anyone was watching. 
In simpler terms, they kissed, nibbled, fondled one another, completely untroubled by onlookers. Meanwhile, the succubus merely sat on the sidelines, scavenging for the remnants of their life energy. She couldn't captivate anyone, so this was how she sustained herself. Watching all these couples, she pondered if there was someone she could latch onto. Yet, she soon noticed a solitary man who had cast a few glances in her direction. The maiden was taken aback, unable to believe that he was looking at her. However, he averted his gaze, leaving her dissatisfied. She suspected it wasn't a coincidence, this man was definitely fixated on her. Unable to resist, she rose and approached him, inquiring whether he knew her and why he was gazing at her. He responded by looking at the floor and merely stated that she was beautiful. Of course, at that moment, he believed the succubus to be a man. Upon hearing the compliment, the maiden lost her composure and began to interrogate the man about where exactly she was beautiful, urging him to provide more detail. This marked the first compliment she had received since her arrival in this destitute universe. However, the man somewhat evaded a direct response, stating that she simply needed to look in the mirror, and then she would immediately understand her own beauty. Lavi struggled to contain her excitement. This man was incredibly attractive. Though he might appear austere, his physique was undoubtedly impressive. The succubus was elated that her long wait had finally been rewarded. Subsequently, the maiden, seated opposite the man, raised a glass of alcohol and suggested that since they were alone, they could drink together. The man raised the corners of his lips and agreed. Nevertheless, our succubus imbibed rather quickly. However, the man was unaware that it was all a facade. In reality, it was just another plan to captivate men. When her drinking companion realized there was nothing more to do, he scooped her up in his arms. That was when everything began to follow Lavi's plan. The young man gently placed the maiden upon the bed, urging her to rise, for she was not inebriated. However, she, with her eyes slightly ajar, smiled and confessed to being exposed. Bending over her, the young man asserted that she was a poor pretender. The succubus then inquired of her newfound companion, why, then, had he fallen for this ruse? Was it, perhaps, due to her beauty? Taking the maiden's chin in his grasp, the young man leaned closer, his eyes fixed upon her lips, and inquired why she would question it when she already knew the answer to her query. The maiden, elated, as this was a true delight she had long yearned for. As the young man's hands began to explore beneath her attire, the maiden suddenly remembered that she was, indeed, a woman, and that she possessed feminine attributes. Startled and in a panic, she pushed her companion away. He was bewildered by her reaction. While the succubus grappled with how to proceed, convinced that her companion would surely desert her upon discovering her true gender. The young man, however, cast a somewhat disgruntled look and inserted his thumb into her mouth, gently applying pressure to her lower jaw to keep it ajar. The maiden, puzzled, inquired as to his action. This was a world of male love, after all. She must not ruin everything. Smiling somewhat nervously, the maiden began to disrobe the young man, suggesting that he would enjoy it more, wouldn't he? She believed that their paths were unlikely to cross again, so she sought to savor this encounter to the fullest. When she instructed him to undress, he complied, inadvertently dropping his glasses. When he looked at the maiden, she recognized him. However, she couldn't believe it. Her acquaintance's face was identical to that of the hunter, the one whose presence spelled death for her kind, those who fell to the ground because of him. This young man was darker than the night and more akin to a demon than the very demon embodied as the harbinger of death. Pointing a firearm at the maiden, he inquired about her name. After her encounter with the hunter, the demoness's life had become a continuous flight. This hunter was renowned for pursuing his quarry relentlessly. Could it be that he had ventured into this book? When the young man failed to understand what was occurring with his supposed nighttime partner, the demoness produced an odd sound. When the hunter sought clarification, she unexpectedly struck him in the face with her fist and made a dash for it. She had lost so much running from this man. She had abandoned her home, cast aside her pride, and endured countless dreadful days in an effort to preserve her wretched existence. She couldn't die now. The maiden returned to her own abode and rushed to Sarah's room, calling out loudly to him. She nestled beside the slumbering young man and attempted to convey something to him. The maiden referred to the hunter with a derogatory term, and Sarah asked her what manner of derogatory term she was referring to. He resolved to verify this and slipped his hand under the maiden's pajamas. He informed her that there was still nothing there. However, she pushed him away, remarking that this was not the time. She informed him that the hunter of demons had entered this world. 
Sarah then inquired whether this was the same hunter who relentlessly pursued the demoness and was even willing to dive into the sewer for her. The demoness confirmed it was indeed him, Ligon, that cruel wretch. The demoness proceeded to recount the entire tale to her confidant. Following her account, Sarah told her not to fear, for a mere mortal had entered this world. However, the demoness was indignant. So many demons had perished because of this so-called mere mortal. Did Sarah not remember how diligently he had hunted her down? Following the demoness, he would come for Sarah as well. Sarah should not behave as though it only concerned her. Sarah inquired, why would the hunter wish to kill him? He didn't even remember the demoness correctly. The maiden asked, did Sarah truly assume that the hunter had forgotten her? Sarah explained that even they, the demons, found it difficult to recall their own existence due to the potent enchantments that pervaded this world. Humans were not immune to this magic. Did the demoness truly believe he could have preserved his consciousness? Finally, the maiden recalled that her mind, too, had been muddled upon first entering this world. Nevertheless, hunters were still but mortals. Regardless, they were humans without any magical abilities. Thus, Sarah advised the maiden to cease panicking, for the answer was apparent. Did she truly think the hunter would release her if he recalled her true identity? The demoness inquired whether he could have feigned it. Sarah, with a hint of mockery, asked, that rascal, and why would he bother pretending? He has no reason to squander his time when the prey is already within his grasp. Ligon, the one who, shortly after officially becoming a hunter, single-handedly infiltrated the heart of the New York Demon Party. On his very first mission, he sent dozens of our kin to the afterlife, not even sustaining a scratch, merely tearing his clothing slightly. Ser, an ancient demon far removed from earthly existence, remains nonchalant about it all. However, she, a lesser demon compelled to lead an earthly life, feared that she might have to go into hiding to avoid inadvertently crossing paths with Ligon on the street. The maiden began to tremble with fear. Sarah then cupped her face in his hands, inquiring whether she truly feared him so greatly. If so, she would have to kill him. Sarah, cradling the demoness's visage in his palms, declared that if she feared the hunter so greatly, then she should be the one to dispatch him. The maiden was taken aback by this proclamation from the demon. She pushed him away and asked if he had lost his mind. What if someone were to overhear? Rubbing the hand she had recently struck, he retorted that she was excessively timorous. He had merely offered her advice. Nevertheless, he cast a lingering gaze upon the maiden, noting her provocative countenance. Drawing her closer to him by her leg, he deftly removed her pajamas, leaving her lower body entirely exposed, all the while remarking that he had provided counsel, and now it was time for her to pay the fee. She attempted to resist his advances, for she considered their conversation to be of grave import. However, she soon found herself unable to continue protesting due to the adept movements of the gentleman's tongue. Sarah, on the other hand, was intrigued by the enchanting energy emanating from this ligon or glugan and the delectable fragrance it carried. The maiden inquired if she had gone mad, considering eating a hunter. Did Sarah think she had no pride left or lacked other sustenance? Nevertheless, Sarah thought precisely that. He advised her to simply pretend she hadn't seen him, as he would not remember her anyway. However, the demoness expressed her persistent fear of him. After all, Sarah had never been pursued by this young man, which was why he remained unaware of just how fearsome he could be. Yet again, the maiden was unable to complete her thought due to the gentleman's skillful tongue. The maiden complained that his energy was foul, but she had tasted the hunter with pleasure. She covered her mouth with her hand and stated that humor was not on her mind at the moment. Sarah asked if the foolish Lavi needed help to ensure the hunter never pursued her again. Lavi pondered whether she would once again be dependent on him. Despite being a demon herself, she needed the assistance of another demon in such a perilous situation, as her pride alone would not suffice. She resolved that this would be the last time, a hint of an unfocused gaze as she gazed at Sarah, stating her desire for his assistance. When the demons arrived at Ligon's chamber, he was still unconscious. Sarah noticed that Lavi must have been frolicking with him all night, given the expression on his face. Lavi, however, somewhat embarrassed, claimed that she had been ravenously hungry. Had Ligon been an ordinary man, she would have extracted more than just his life energy. Lavi was convinced that this man's taste was absolutely divine and deemed it unjust that he was a hunter. Sarah, pointing at the slumbering Ligon, inquired if the maiden was absolutely certain she needed help. If she truly pitied him, she should remain with him as if nothing had transpired. However, Lavi stated that these were two distinct matters. Sarah hastened the maiden, suggesting that she needed to resolve her predicament swiftly, as the young man would awaken at any moment. Sarah, his hands in his pockets, declared that it mattered not. He had already received his payment. The maiden, arms crossed over her chest, responded that, on the contrary, she was the one who had received payment. 
The intercourse, of course, had been excellent, but she could not feed on Sarah's energy as it was too impure and ancient, much like Sarah himself. While the maiden was lost in thought, Sarah took action. Observing the strange sound, the maiden turned and noticed that Ligon, still unconscious, had lost a significant amount of blood. She looked at Sarah in alarm, inquiring about the havoc he had wrought. Smiling, Sarah explained that, no matter how monstrous a man Ligon might be, he would not survive with a crushed heart. Observing the bloodied Ligon, the young lady inquired about Sarah's actions. The demon then stated that the hunter would no longer be able to pursue her. However, the young lady erupted, proclaiming Sarah to be a psychopath. That did not justify killing Ligon. Sarah instructed the young lady to be silent. He had already aided her, so she could depart. She implored him to stop and go with her. At that moment, Ligon's hand began to move, which Sarah noticed, baffled by how Ligon managed to shift his hand. Subsequently, the pair watched as the hunter was resurrected. Upon recognizing the hunter's revival, Sarah burst into laughter. It was a complete fiasco. Afterward, he promptly departed, leaving Lavi alone with the hunter. Hearing the sound of the awakening hunter, the young lady was overcome with extreme fear. The hunter also rose and held his head, which ached severely. Then, he noticed the retreating maiden, and she realized that she had been spotted, asking if he had indeed awakened. Ligon approached her, pinning her against the wall while pressing his elbow to her throat. As a result, Lavi collapsed to the floor. The hunter inquired why the young lady had struck him and decided to escape. The young lady could think of nothing but the fact that this wretch was not merely a hunter but possessed an immortal body, condemning her to play this relentless cat and mouse game with him for life. It was simply inconceivable treachery. The young man gazed at the lady seated on the floor and remarked that she had not been averse to his advances the previous night. He questioned why she had struck him. The lady stared at the young man in astonishment, believing he would immediately seek retribution upon awakening. She then asked if he truly did not remember that he was a hunter. The young man inquired, a hunter, like Snow White. The lady clarified that it was not the case. She explained that he had been a demon hunter. The young man inhaled deeply and asked what nonsense the lady was spouting. Upon hearing his words, the lady inwardly rejoiced, thrilled that her prayers had finally been answered, turning this hunter tale into one of an ordinary young man. Everything should be straightforward from here. The lady then rose and offered her apologies, saying that the young man had awakened instantly after her blow. However, she believed she had a strong ability to control ordinary people. Taking the young man's hand, she explained that as soon as he had awakened from her strike, they had spent the entire night together. The young man, however, insisted that she was lying, as such an occurrence had not taken place. While she held his hand, she employed a binding technique. It was a slave sigil designed to control a person. The demoness had decided to turn the demon hunter into her slave, seeking retribution for all her suffering. Afterward, she bared her neck slightly, suggesting that he look at her, emphasizing the visible traces. The young man, however, had no recollection of leaving such marks. In truth, these marks were the work of Sarah. But the young lady did not wish to divulge this information. She persisted in pressuring Ligon, insisting that he must recall their agreement to meet. For a moment, the young man's eyes grew cloudy, and he admitted that indeed, it had transpired as she described. The young lady was elated, her plan had succeeded. In her thoughts, she considered what lay ahead for this demon hunter. He would become a slave, awestruck even by her nostril picking. Lavi would orchestrate a life in which she feasted upon his fresh life energy. Then, once she had drained him completely, she would discard him without remorse, like a sack of refuse. Such were Lavi's thoughts. However, she was perplexed as to why they were sitting in a library, merely engaged in learning. Lavi sat, savoring the exquisite weather, pondering that only imbeciles would confine themselves within concrete walls in such conditions. Regrettably, she was one such fool. She and the hunter were seated in the library of the Bell Academy, the educational institution in the boy's love novel in which Lavi pursued her studies. Spring had graced the already splendid academy, beckoning the youth outdoors. The library stood deserted because the examinations were far in the future. Lavi could only gaze enviously at those who roamed the streets, all thanks to one tactless hunter. The demoness had not anticipated that following her fabricated story the previous day, they would immediately begin acting as a couple. However, a first rendezvous in the library was a rather unexpected development. She had hoped that upon arriving, they would engage in acts of love. Instead, the young man was now fully absorbed in his books. He had not paid her any attention for the past two hours, despite being such a handsome young fellow. Observing the young man, the maiden decided to playfully entice him. She took him by the hand and inquired if they might engage in something more intriguing. Subsequently, she laid her hand upon his thigh. 
Yet the young man cast a stern gaze upon her, advising her not to engage in foolishness in a public place. Disrobing with a man in broad daylight was not his usual habit. Ligon then suggested that Lavi read rather than clutter her mind with indecent thoughts. The young lady, however, was not inclined to back down. She believed that a touch of enchantment and seduction would evoke a response from him. She began applying her magic, luring Ligon toward her. When she thought she had succeeded, she noticed the young man return to his books once more. She was greatly surprised that nothing had transpired. She was convinced that her enchantment was perfectly placed. By all accounts, this young man should have obeyed her like an obedient dog. Yet he displayed no sign of arousal. This prompted the young lady to attempt a more potent enchantment. This time, she was convinced that it had worked. She believed that once she placed her mark on him, she would be able to do whatever she pleased. However, it appeared he possessed an ironclad will. Nevertheless, Lavi persuaded herself that because he was an ordinary man, he would be powerless against demons. If circumstances had not compelled her, no demon would deign to engage with this gloomy scholar. Or perhaps they would. The maiden gazed upon her current beau's attractive countenance and swallowed. He lured her in, and she resolved to simply try to kiss him. When the young man awoke, he felt something moist, slippery, and soft. Upon opening his eyes, he noticed a young lady straddling him and was profoundly surprised. He pushed her away and grasped her by the chin, casting a malevolent glare her way as he advised her against indulging in obscenities in a public place. Ligon then inquired if Lavi had intended to mount him while he slept. The young lady failed to comprehend the situation. It appeared more as if he were hanging on to her. They had seemingly swapped positions. After pushing him away, she declared that he was not intriguing. Everything was because of him. Subsequently, she rose and fled. Although Lavi had escaped, the energy consumed was still within her, which she considered a plus. It had been a while since she had encountered such a substantial source. As she ran, a black shadow encircled her legs, causing her to lose her balance. She was profoundly frightened and subsequently found herself in a peculiar room. Then she saw Sarah. The young man believed that she had met her demise. The young lady, in response, branded him as an impudent scoundrel. He stated that he would assist her. How dare he leave her alone there? However, the young man approached her, took hold of her chin, and gazed into her eyes. Sarah had acquired the mark by aiding her. Sarah approached Lavi and gently cradled her chin, gazing into her eyes. He mentioned that not long ago, she had clung to him, seeking assistance, but now, she had no need for him. He had received the brand in return for aiding her. The maiden was bewildered, not comprehending his words. What brand was he referring to? A brand, the curse placed upon those who killed a Vatican hunter, but only if the hunter perished. Taking the demon by the hands, she told him not to lie, for the hunter was alive and well. Thus, there couldn't be a claim on Ser. She turned him around, thinking there was nothing there. However, when she lifted his shirt, she noticed the brand. She couldn't fathom why it had appeared. The hunter was indeed alive. Yet Sarah insisted the brand was real, indicating that Ligon was dead. Lavi struggled to understand how someone could return from death. There was a vast difference between surviving an attempt on one's life and coming back to life after dying. Surviving was a divine blessing, while returning from the dead was a curse. Even God couldn't perform such a feat. This curse only took effect if the one imposing it possessed sufficient hatred and magical power. So, who could have cursed the Vatican hunter? The more Lavi learned about him, the more frightened she became. Sarah then commented that at times, the slain did not die. He inquired about how Lavi managed to survive. The young lady, somewhat embarrassed, admitted that she had bound Ligon. Sarah, incredulous, asked if she had indeed bewitched the hunter. Lavi, self-satisfied, claimed that she had done precisely that and very successfully. After all, the young man had admitted that without his memories, Ligon was just an ordinary person. Thus, she had done what she did best. Mid-conversation, Lavi glanced at her phone, which displayed messages from Ligon. He asked why she was angry and requested her to try again with him. She didn't know who had cursed him, but now Ligon was her thrall. Displaying her phone to Sare, Lavi told him that when he saw the hunter again, he shouldn't be surprised that this young man obeyed her. Then she fled, and Sare considered her a fool. He hoped she would become wiser as soon as possible. On the following day, Ligon and Lavi crossed paths. When the young lady noticed him within her field of vision, she approached him and embraced him tightly. However, adjusting his glasses, he requested that she remove her hands. Lavi inquired what was the matter, after all, he was the cause of her offense yesterday. However, she noticed something that greatly shocked her. The young man invited the young lady to sit down. Lavi was perplexed as to why her seal had been partially erased. Ligon then mentioned that with each encounter, she seemed increasingly familiar to him. 
hadn't they met before in New York? In reality, that was indeed where they had first met. However, the city was absent from the novel. Why was he talking about it? Could it be that Ligon's memory had returned? Lavi then mentioned that the same bar was named New York, and Ligon added that there was even a party there. The young lady asked if he had forgotten. After all, he was the one who had first approached her at the bar and suggested they start seeing each other. Just as Ligon was about to respond, the enchantment took effect once more. He stated that he had apparently forgotten. Lavi was taken aback. Her desperate measures had worked, and she breathed a sigh of relief, realizing the charms were still in effect. Approaching them, the waiter inquired if they were ready to place an order. Ligon ordered an Americano and something else. As she gazed at the hunter, Lavi thought that simply by looking at him, he seemed like the most ordinary character in the novel. Perhaps she had struck him too hard on the head, and this had become a side effect. When the waiter mentioned that they operated on a prepaid basis, Ligon reached into his bag, removed his card, and dropped the gun. It was Artemis. The waiter picked up the gun and returned it to Ligon. Lavi, upon seeing it, thought that it was the end for her. Artemis was a sacred relic used for hunting demons. Should Ligon remember who he was, Lavi's life would be in jeopardy, considering the presence of this pistol. What could she do now? The young lady then remembered Ser and thought that since he was an ancient demon, he must surely have a solution for this. She addressed Ligon, stating that she needed to make a phone call. He responded briefly. As soon as Ser picked up the receiver, Lavi asked if he knew that her seal was being erased. She was currently in a difficult situation. Ser replied that, of course, he knew. Did Lavi think that a man under the protection of the Vatican could be easily ensnared by an enchantment? He then inquired about when Lavi would become a true demon. The young lady was deeply distressed. She asked if Ser could defeat him. After all, he was very powerful. Ser inquired how he could defeat someone who didn't die. Lavi then asked if he could at least send him far away. Into his shadow, perhaps. Did their world have a boundary at all? Was a visa required for relocation? Ser stated that if Lavi had considered fleeing, the seal would surely disappear. And when that happened, the return of Ligon's memories would only be a matter of time. While Lavi was on the phone, Ligon approached her from behind and pulled out a gun. The young lady was terrified, watching him start to load it, and she screamed loudly. She screamed loudly, sitting down and covering her ears. But she then realized that nothing was happening. The young man was merely lighting a cigarette. He inquired whether he could smoke there. The young lady was greatly astonished. Could it be that the pistol was just a lighter? Ligon approached Lavi and asked whether she had dropped something. However, she responded negatively. Ligon observed that something was amiss with the young lady today. Her countenance was full of horror. She could not ascertain whether Ligon was dangerous at the moment. She couldn't come to terms with the idea of him being an ordinary man with Artemis or merely pretending to be one. The young lady needed substantial proof of the hunter's harmlessness. She looked somewhat awkwardly at Ligon and inquired whether she could have some noodles at his place. Such words might arouse carnal desires in an individual. A regular hunter would never agree to such a proposition. However, Ligon was indeed not ordinary. Just as Lavi had requested, the young man prepared noodles for her. Nevertheless, she was slightly dissatisfied and wondered if he might be castrated. She set down her chopsticks and grasped her glass of water, asking the young man whether he genuinely thought she had come to eat noodles. But he, placing the glass of water on the table, urged her to see speaking nonsense at the table. The young lady pouted, turned away, and declared that she wouldn't eat anymore. However, the young man inquired about where she was headed, what was the most interesting thing. Lavi turned around and asked precisely what he meant. Ligon then mentioned that in the library, the young lady had expressed a desire for something more captivating gesturing towards the bed. He stated that they should proceed in that direction. Ligon and Lavi ardently kissed. However, after a short while, Ligon pulled away. The young lady couldn't comprehend why. The young man explained that he wished to halt, as he had reconsidered engaging in something engaging. His behavior truly deviated from the norm. This prompted Lavi to push him by the shoulders, toppling him onto the bed. She looked quite menacing and declared that she would continue. Ligon fell silent. Nevertheless, this Vatican saint was excessively relaxed. The young lady swiftly began to disrobe the young man. However, as she stretched his shirt, she accidentally tore off a button that flew into her face. Ligon, touching the spot where the button struck, smiled and remarked that it seemed Lavi preferred such an occurrence. She affirmed that indeed, it was to her liking, and that the young man ought to simply recline and relish the moment. However, in reality, she was not fond of such an occurrence. Typically, she lay down tranquilly and relished the moment. However, her charms had no effect on this wretch. Thus, she had no choice but to relinquish her preferences. 
So, this is what the young lady enjoys. At that moment, the seal on the young man began to strengthen. This concludes the first part of the retelling of this manhwa. If we can collect 500 likes on this video, there will be a continuation of this interesting story. So please like and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the continuation of this manhwa.